Hi friend, hope you're doing well and welcome to today's episode of the Your Audio Solutions podcast. Real pleasure having you here. Um, and we have a great show today. Uh, we have recording engineer, uh, music producer, Yuan Scherer. Uh, and if you're into the Mars Volta, Omar Rodriguez Lopez at Drive-In, I'm sure you know about Yuan and his company Clouds Hill. Um, they're obviously releasing the the new highly anticipated the Mars Volta box set. I don't really want to pronounce it in Spanish because I will butcher it, but in English it's called uh, The Reality of Dreams. It's coming out this month in April and it looks badass. I don't know, I mean, I've seen a lot of you guys, Mars Volta fans, um, been really excited about this box set. And honestly, I would be too if I, if I uh, had managed to order it before it sold out. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm sure you know by Yuan, if you're into the Mars Volta or anything um, Omar does. And it was a real pleasure having Yuan on. And I'm sure you will love this conversation too. And especially if you're into the Mars Volta and all those guys. Uh and we actually delve into some how you and met Omar and how they work together and a lot of really awesome stuff that I'm sure you're going to enjoy hearing about. And if you're one of the lucky fans already who have received your box set, the vinyl box set, please let me know in the comments what you think of it. How does the, the vinyl sound? Uh, was How's the art, um, artwork like? Is it is it good? Is the the... The stuff you get cool. I'd uh, love to hear, actually. Let me know in, in the comments below. And also for for you guys who didn't get, get a chance to order the, the box set, Yuan does, does tell the interview that there will be some more um, vinyls released. So if you haven't got your hands on it, there will be another chance for you as well to order yours. So, yeah, if you're one of those unlucky people like me who didn't get a chance to order it, go get it. Uh, it should be available on release day or something like that. But again, real pleasure having you on, on and I'm, I'm sure you're going to love this interview. It doesn't matter if you're into the Mars Volta or not. If you have a recording studio, if you're in the music business at all, if you make music, I think you're going to find something useful out of this interview. Uh, and also before we get into the interview you on, um, I'd love for you to subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, or Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We're growing slowly but steadily and that's all thanks to you. So I really appreciate your support. Uh, yeah, like I said, we're growing slowly but steadily and it's awesome to see. And that means we can get more cool guests on and do some more awesome stuff for you guys. So I really appreciate your support. And also before we get into the interview with Yuan, I'd love for you to check out the Audio Tribe. Uh, there's a link to it in the description below. Just enter your name and email address and you had joined the Audio Tribe email list. It's free, of course. Um, and if you join, you get exclusive access to interviews before the public uh, and much more stuff I'd like to do in the future as we grow. Again, just click the link below, enter your name and email address and you have joined the Audio Tribe email list. Super easy, free, of course. Uh, I'd love to see you join. Um, but that's it. Let's get into the interview with you and share. So please enjoy. And I mean, it's a real pleasure talking to you, man. Uh, thank you for taking your time. Sure. Thanks for asking. It's a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Likewise. Likewise. Uh, I, I love your studio, by the way. Are you in uh, Studio One or what do you call that room? Yeah, it's Studio One. The Neve room hmm. looks like this. Yeah, yeah. That's the console. That's awesome. one of the racks. And here's here's another one. It's yep. a nice spacious room. Yeah, it's it's kind of big for a control room, isn't it? I don't mm. know. When I when I built it in sixteen years ago, I I honestly had no idea about acoustics and why control rooms were built like most of the people built them, so Right. I just wanted it to be like that. It's uh, it's 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 a great it's a great sounding room. It kind of developed in the last almost one and a half decade, no more than one and a half decades. So right. I still enjoy being here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure, man. It, it's in Hamburg, right? It's not Hanover. 
Oh, it's not Hanover. Jesus, the Scorpions are from Hanover. No, no, <laughs> no, Hamburg, the, the city yeah, of yeah. the Beatles. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because, yeah, just before the call, I was like, wait, it was Hamburg or was it Hanover? Because I had a friend who lived in Hanover. Then my mind started to be like, oh, wait, what was it? Who's that? <laughs> who's that? Gerhard Schröder, our former chancellor, lives in Hanover. Aha, I see, I see. Cool. No, Hanover is a is a is a totally different thing. Hamburg is it, it it's a small city. I mean, compared to I don't know Berlin or London, it's a very very mm. small place, more like a village kind of feel. But mm. it's you know, I enjoy being here because it's the opposite of Berlin. You can't really create a hype in Hamburg. You know, right. everyone's just chilled and. If you do something cool and new and fresh in Berlin, you might be able to gather like, I don't know, 150 people within five minutes. Mm. Over here in Hamburg, it, it more like takes, I don't know, five years. Right. Because everyone's just like, ah, oh, let's wait and see. I don't feel like going there. I'll check <laughs> it out in a year. But still, you've got so many cool bands coming, working with you in, in Hamburg. So, I mean, you know, you don't need Berlin. Oh, I don't, I, I personally don't need Berlin. That's true. I think, I don't know, Berlin, Berlin obviously still got Hansa Studios, which is a great place. And the whole U2 and, and Bowie and whatnot stories are all based in Berlin. But people tend to forget that Hamburg is the city where the Beatles started. Hamburg is, well, you know, I like the fact that Hamburg's got a harbor and was always all through history, a place where people were able to connect to the rest of the world. And, um, and I think, I think that's what I'm, what I'm trying to do with this place with Cloud Sill over here. It's, it's, this place is not Hamburg. This right. place could be anywhere. And, and it's just in Hamburg and, and I don't work with bands from Hamburg to serve the Hamburg music industry. You know, that was never, ever what I wanted to do. I wouldn't, I always wanted to work with, I don't know, with people I haven't met before mm. <laughs> and wanted to create something that we then could, I don't know, shoot out into the world, spread over the planet or however you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, you definitely succeeded doing that as well, which is, yes, I don't think that's very easy to do, but yeah, you, you did it somehow. I don't know. I don't know how that happened, to be honest. It's, it's, it's weird, you know, because everything, you know, when I built the studio 16 years ago, um, many other studios clo were closing because that was like Napster time and budgets crashed and the record companies didn't have any money for big studios and people started home recording and but I was super young and I wanted to I wanted to run a cool studio for my own projects and, and other projects so I was able to get my hands around some gear a tape machine a desk and that's that that was basically it and then i don't know people started coming here and at some point just after a couple of months or one or two years or so i met the guys of faust over here in the elevator faust is a kraut rock band from from germany hmm. like like can you probably know can or mm -hmm. noi or, or or like all these kraut rock yeah. bands and and in that band um was a guy called James Johnston and he used to be the organ player of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds of the Bad Seeds and we became friends quite quickly within a couple of days and then I started to produce his band Gallon Drunk from London two albums then we released them then I produced his solo record and He's connected to the, I don't know, PJ Harvey, Nick Cave mm. scene. And I don't know, I think that's, as soon as you, in that, in that area, you know, and word of mouth is going on, then you just have to do proper work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ride the wave. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And listen, you have to listen. I think that's, 
that's that's the most important aspect of for everything. You know, there are so many cool studios in there, but you know, when the people in the studio don't listen to what they what they're doing, that's a uh, then it gets weird. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's actually something I wanted to get in with or get in on with you. Um, you know, because I, you you mentioned it now as well is. You know, you started a studio 16 years ago. You said a lot of studios were closing down, etc. And that's still happening to this day, obviously. And uh, one of the, maybe the biggest challenge with having a studio is, you know, the, the, the money it costs to run it, you know, the rent, your own money, etc., etc., your life. Um, and I see, I mean, myself, I struggle with that a lot too when I started out and my friends do or did. Um, so what was your process of, or maybe still your process to this day of, of getting the business in like how did you build your client base you, you you mentioned now you met those guys and that became i guess part of it but uh w- was that it like was that enough to rely on throughout the years or did you have to build no many it's more it's the hustle is real it's it's a, it's a constant challenge you know there are good years and there are horrible years obviously well, last year, the COVID year started started at, started with a cancellation of I don't know ninety days, wow, yeah. which is basically what I have to have every year, otherwise it doesn't work. So, and that got cancelled in in March or early April last year. But then a bigger a bigger German band called the Atsta booked a I don't know forty forty five day session kind of quarantine session just here. They, they plan to record it in various places and then they condensed it down to 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 this place. So th- I was lucky. And that that happened often. But but to answer your question, well I was a musician myself it, when I was very young and I had a deal with Sony back in the days and they just paid us shitloads of money. That was when the industry was still still working. And you got like, I don't know, six figure advances or seven. So I put a lot of that money into the studio. Right. So that was the start of it. And well, at some point I knew it couldn't only it, it can't only be just the studio, you know, you have to be um you have to add every single aspect the music industry has to this business. So I added the label, uh, publishing company, merchandise, effects company, and that's what we're doing. I mean, I mean, you know, our concept these days basically is: on one hand, I have the bands plus. Plus another factor, you know, at some point the flights get really cheap and our rent over here in Hamburg isn't that high compared to London or New York or LA rents. And when the flight got so cheap, it was actually more affordable for bands to fly over to here, save some money on the studio. They didn't have to pay lots of money for the flights. So the whole thing, like fly the whole band out to Hamburg and record there, um, became a thing. That's why many bands from the UK flew over and did it here, except the London. And well, you still have to deliver good work because if the studio would have been shit that nobody, it, it's important that people come back. You know, mm-hmm. that's the business. That's the business. You have to have like, I don't know, a dozen clients you can rely on. How do you do um, that then? How do you make? How do you make your clients coming back to you? I mean, you mentioned great work. Uh, what what does it. that mean to you? It's just, it, well, it means that it means that ah, you can't be picky with anything. You know, I, I you know, I, I'm a music producer, but when a band comes here with the producer and their engineer, I'm I'm just the landlord. You know, <laughs> I'm just I'm just some random dude that owns the studio and. And then I'll make the coffee. And I, I really enjoy that. I think that's the secret. I really enjoy that. And I, I, I enjoy, I don't enjoy doing run, run out jobs anymore, <laughs> but I used to enjoy that. I, I just like the studio vibe and I think people get that. And um, I respect, I respect creative work and 
I respect I respect people that work creatively and I know what it takes because I'm a musician myself. I know what I know that people can be weird sometimes and that some stuff needs some magic, some silence and other stuff needs other things. I don't know how to describe it. It's just Artists can be weird and you have to accept that. And I think you you can't you, you can't control too much in the studio. You know what I, I in like six years after I opened this place, I started to have this annual festival called Cloudso Festival, oh. where like four, five, six bands play in the live rooms. And then we just invite 200, 300 people to the studio ask them to take their shoes off and then we have a party all night long and people ask me and you know everything's the guitars are still on the wall the gear is still where it is everything's just like like it would be in a studio maybe a little cleaner um and people always ask me hey aren't you afraid that people steal or break shit or so and that never happened that never right. ever happened i think it's a it's a karma thing you know yeah 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 but I love that you said that people have to take their shoes off. Is that? Uh, it's not mandatory. Like... It's not mandatory. Right. I do it. I do it because I feel at home here. I I never have my yeah, shoes yeah. on except now, and I don't know why I have them on actually. Um, <laughs> but that's hilarious yeah. because I mean, obviously, I I'm, I'm from Sweden originally, uh, but been here in the UK for you know for seven years or something. Um, the, the the that culture cultural difference of taking your shoes off is <laughs> it's hilarious because people here don't really know how to do it because we were just selling our flat in London and we have to tell people oh can you please take your shoes off and they always took their shoes off outside the flat <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious because <laughs> like what the hell I mean you could, you could take them off in the hallway you know that's what the hallway is for but you know it's, it's, it's hilarious <laughs> well, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, my friends from the UK feel very uncomfortable taking their shoes off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's also it's it's a rock cliche that you have to wear boots all the time. Right. So I enjoy I enjoy breaking with all these macho cliches. I love you know you know I have kids and normally it took time. It took time to establish that. But now when I produce a record for longer than two days or so, which is mostly the case, I just sit down on the very first day. I sit down with the band and tell them, hey, I'd like to start early. And then I like to work for, I don't know, six, seven, eight hours. Then I have to pick my kids up from school. Then I, I do family time. I put them to bed. And then I come back, and mostly when I'm come back, I'm in my pajamas, because like I do my I do my evening routine at home, and then I just jump in the car and drive over here and 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 record, and that's just such a comfortable thing to do. I don't know why anybody should, everybody should do it. It's so mm. cool. But I love that you you actually set those boundaries. Because usually, I mean, I'm I'm 100 percent sure you you work like this also, where you work all night, all day, and oh. you, it doesn't it's not sustainable. But I love that you actually have boundaries like that, and bands respect it, I guess. Yeah, well, it depends, right? I can't set those right. boundaries when when I'm not the producer and of sure. the session, obviously. So when like I have two people working here in the studio, Linda and and Muxi, and I mean, they sometimes they have to work crazy hours. You know, they start at eleven and then they work till nine p.m. Then they all go out for dinner and then they work till four a.m. Mm. So it's I, I don't get it. I mean, nothing good happens after midnight, in my opinion. But when you talk to someone, and well, there are two things. When you talk to someone like Omar Rodriguez Lopez, mm. he would say everything happens after midnight. Oh, but there's yeah, also shit. <laughs> and and he's right, and he's right. It's just a matter of of how your body works, right? And and then it comes to the time difference. So I work a lot. I, I often work with people from the U.S. And if you don't have like a week to to match your schedule, mm -hmm. then obviously they get up very late, and they have their peak of productivity like at I don't know 
9, 10 p.m.-ish. And I'm just tired. And mm. obviously that's that's a nightmare and, and someone has to adjust. And, and usually that's me. And it's super hard for me, to be honest. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, but, but you know, I, I love setting those boundaries because normally, I don't know, when you record with a singer, for example, the usual stuff singers say is, I can't sing in the mornings. Right. I'm like, dude, have you ever tried it? No, of course not. Why would I? Why would I sing in the morning? I can't. I'm like, yeah, right. You don't know that. Why, why <laughs> yeah, do you think they say they can't? Is it because they're a bit phlegmy maybe or what? I think maybe it's part of it might be that most of them need alcohol to start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, some of them are just used to, well, some of them might have a day job and then do music in the afternoons and later. So it's just the thing they got used to over the years. Um, shows are in the evenings at light, like live shows. So it's it's not a common thing to sing in the mornings. But some songs need that. Some songs need that early feel, that that sleepy voice, that super low, not warmed up voice. And but that that that, that wasn't my point. I say people are extremely irritated when I say when I say that the first thing we're gonna do tomorrow is vocals. They're like, oh, I can't do it. And when I tell them, hey, we're gonna have a a four hour break in the afternoon and early evening, and then I come back, they're like shit but what if we're in the middle of something at 4 p.m and you have to leave what if i if i have like a brand new idea and i need to record now because i forget otherwise i'm like we'll figure it out we'll figure it out that one of my people will be here to record it so you don't forget and not everything else we get used to it just take a break man mm. or girl just take a yeah. break, and that and and my experience is that every single person I work with started to really appreciate that kind of workflow, because mm -hmm. taking a break in the afternoon is actually a very very cool thing. Because then yeah. the night makes sense, you know. Then the night makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I love that. I mean, and also you you mentioned it, you know, how to deal with the artists because, you know, like you said, it might say, oh, what if I record and forget, but. Um, isn't there a problem of, oh, but we are paying for the day. Shouldn't you be there? That's never came up with, for you or? Ah, interesting. Well, um, no. No. <laughs> I mean, I guess because you have your people there anyway, so they, they could record. Right. I mean, you know, Many studios have like eight working hours. Is that and, a thing in Germany? I mean, or no, it's 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 a thing everywhere. It's right. a thing everywhere. If you work at if you want to work at I don't know Abbey Road or something, you have your eight hours working slot, and that's it. And that and otherwise you have to pay extra. And I mean, right. our conditions are are pretty fair. You can you can, in theory, work around all around the clock. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we might have to work in shifts that what we started to tell our customers, if you want to work like all day and all night, we might, you might have to pay for two engineers. Right, right. right. Um, but Hey, if you start at eight or 9am and then work till three, what is that? Like eight hours or something or nine, that's a work day. And then yeah, you take yeah. a break and then you add another four. Hmm. That's it's enough time. It's enough time. And, you know, people, people get it. And I don't work with people who complain about, about money. I mean, what kind of relationship would that be? Like you agree to make a record and that's something you have to do together. And when like the person who kind of is responsible for bringing a good record home, the producer, uh, tells you, Hey, I need this break because of my family. If the band doesn't get it, it's not a good work relationship. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, you make a very good point. And, that's I mean, that's something I never really apply myself because I always, maybe because I'm 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 a bit less experienced than you, but I always thought you know like oh, whatever the band wants, like that's sort of the school of thought I'm used to. I think. Uh, yeah, I, and I think it's it's, yeah, it's also true. It's also right, true. Right. But my point is, but my point is, 
when the ban wants you to um to 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 completely reschedule your life mm. for their record and doesn't accept your boundaries then it's not a good working relationship and of course when when you i mean i haven't done this for the last 16 or 20 years i just started that that kind of process recently like five six years ago or so mm. but it was a super important step for me because because I got kids when I was very young, so my oldest son is 16, right. and um, and I always had this weird feeling that I need to be home at some point, and I never, I, I was, I never had the guts to speak it out loud to the bands, because you know having kids in the music industry is is a weird thing. Nobody really respects it, mm. and so for me it was it was a relief to actually to at some point being able to communicate that. Yeah, for sure. And I think people appreciate that. Well, the people I I work with do. Yeah, yeah, I I can definitely uh, imagine that. Um, and yeah, I, we also just had a, a daughter um, almost two months ago. I think it's week oh, seven. Oh wow! Yeah. Really? Congratulations! Yeah, thank you. Uh, you look you you doesn't you don't look so tired. How's that? No, because <laughs> uh, I have a, a wonderful um, fiance. She 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 does mm. you know she she does a lot of good. Good stuff. <laughs> well, the first two months, the first two months aren't too tricky. The baby is pretty much always asleep, asleep like ninety percent of the time, right? Yeah, yeah, during the day, yes, yeah, exactly. Which definitely helps. But did you think you have you could start saying that to clients uh, later on because you had you had this this great track record? I mean, because I guess maybe you could have anyway. But would it be too maybe scary? Like when maybe not scary is the right word, but do you think it's possible to say that starting out, say, hey, I have a, I have whatever I need to deal with at home. You have to respect that. Or do you think you can do that in the beginning? No. Right. Absolutely not. Right. Absolutely not. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I think it would be a good thing. I, uh, you know, my... My advantage always was that I I started to work, you know, I started to work in this studio when I was 22. Right. Um, and the first bigger jobs I had was with that crowd rock band. And all the members are like older than 60. And they liked the fresh vibe. And I liked the experience they had. So that was a very cool corporation for a couple of years. Mm. And what I learned is that you can't force anything in music and everything's part of the process. That was what I learned. And the second step, the second big learning I had was from Omar mm. during the Bosnian Rainbow session his side project, Bosnian Rainbows, he yeah, yeah. wanted me to produce. Um, got this band like with Nikki Casper and D'Anthony Parks um, and Terry Genderbender and Omar. They were all such, they were all so amazing players. They would just go into the room, play it once, and that's it. And they nailed it. And that's I love that because, yeah, because because that's how it should be right so i had loads of time doing sound check and doing my thing and then the bank band came in bam done but what i found hard to understand is that in between those takes the band needed hours to chill they just chill they smoked they ate they I don't know what they did. They did everything except playing. And I was I was I was doing my German thing like guys <laughs> you pay for this. Let me let me do some work. And Omar was like, "Dude, dude, we need to chill." And I was like, "Ah. Okay. Okay, I finally understood. You need to chill. It's part of the process. Okay, why don't you chill for 
th 60 minutes and then we <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. work and you laugh and omar like burst into tears and because uh, laughing because he was he, he thought it was so funny and he, he he's like dude that's such a culture clash you can't have the right. word chill and a certain amount of time in the same sentence you know right. chilling is supposed to be endless and i thought it was very funny but it took me a while to really understand what he meant and what he meant was really dude you can't define the starting point right. it'll come to us okay it'll come to us and and that was such a great way to work because obviously I could just join the round of chilling people or go home and say like, all right, hey, give me three hours because they respected that as well. You know, that's my chill bit, like to have some part with some time with my family. And I think as long as you're able to explain that kind of process to people you're working with, um, they get it. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's hilarious because I think I'm like you there. I'm like, okay, chill for this time and then let's get to work. I don't know if that what that has to do with maybe because we are European or, you know, German, it's, Swedish is, you know, Germanic ish, you know, or Germanic, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I'm it, the same way. Yeah, it's yeah. it's that it's it's a cultural thing. We 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 don't know how to let go yeah 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 that's hilarious man because i work with bands and i also felt that same frustration we're like guys it's you know it's midnight and we've been you know chilling and eating for the last two hours like you know i, I don't know what it is but i find that hilarious man that you're the same way <laughs> and yeah it must yeah. be culture clash or just a different maybe it's like because you're engineer producer there's a certain mindset to that you know uh, I think the most, you know it's also that it's also that you know because I what I learned and that's just something that that comes with experience and I know that for a fact I can obviously only speak speak for myself but at some point in my life I I I started to realize that things will come to me when I talk about creativity you know and like I wrote two books and that's always pressure because you got deadlines and it's so much stuff to write. And I wrote a couple of albums like music and lyrics. And that's always pressure because you have a deadline and a date in the studio. And you can't force it. Pressure doesn't work, at least for me. But it'll come to me. I know 12 hours before the deadline, I will sit down and it'll come to me. And that, that time of nothing before that, it's not worthless. It's the other way around. You need that time of nothingness to let your brain relax, let the thoughts come in, let the process do its thing, mm -hmm. and then just put it out there. And as yeah. as long as soon as you realize that 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 works, God, you're that's next level shit when it comes to relaxation. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I can relate to that recently because I, I always try to to take up piano. You know, learn playing piano, and I've been doing it now during lockdown. And I used to be like when I learned guitar, like oh, let's play all day every day. You know, learn something. But I just couldn't do that with piano. You know, uh, and it actually really helped just trying to learn something and it didn't work. And then it came back like a day later and it suddenly worked. And I think that goes along what you're saying is about you know giving your brain to process whatever it has to do yeah and then it just comes i mean it sounds similar exactly you know when you meditate a lot there's always mm -hmm. when you do like um teach meditation where like someone is talking to you all the time and, and guides you through the part or guided meditation it's called mm -hmm. uh and guides you through the process sometimes you have a teacher who does this he he gives a little introduction and then he says, okay, and now concentrate on the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you start from one and you just breathe in and breathe out and imagine those numbers. And every time a thought comes, you just, you just let it go. Just let it go, let it go. And you do that for a couple of minutes. And then 
the guy tells you, okay, and now just tell your brain to let go and think of whatever it wants to do. Meditation's over, kind of that, yeah? Is now you can... Or... Yeah, exactly, for example. And then yeah, yeah, just yeah, let yeah. go of everything. Right, and right. then suddenly you think of nothing. Hmm. And that's the point where the meditation starts, only for 30 seconds, right? Right. So, and you will experience the same thing with your daughter. You will not be able to force her to, to walk. Mm. Mm. Right? It, it, it's just not possible. You can't teach her. You can't teach her. You just have to wait. You just have to wait for one year. And then she, she will, and she will not learn it. It's the wrong way. She will just do it at some point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Totally, man. I mean, yeah, yeah we talk, talk about meditation. It's uh, super helpful i mean did it it sounded very similar to the headspace app is that one you use or do you just use yeah something else? i no i i use two apps i use headspace um i use headspace when i do it alone and i use a, an app called balloon it's very similar but it's in german when i do it with my kids and my younger kids they they're not fluent in english so i have an english app and a, oh, and okay. a german app. that's awesome because eh? i also been thinking of or me and my fiance have been thinking about also introducing meditation at some point to to our kids i think it would be very beneficial um, absolutely yeah awesome man. Yeah, well but, doing 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 nothing is the greatest skill you you well it's it's so hard for me it's the hardest thing you know sometimes i'm not able to to meditate for a minute or so it's just it's so difficult hmm. so difficult yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's it's practice like anything else. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I'd love to go back to you know working with Omar because I know you worked with uh, obviously you worked on that the new project with the Mars Volta. But did you also work on the architecture? Like, did you record some some stuff for that album? I think so. I think so. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't realize when I when I was doing it actually. <laughs> You know, I've, Omar and I, we, we just go way back and we work on, on, on stuff all the time. And, and sometimes when, he, when he's here or when I'm at his place, we just work at very stuff that ends up being a Mars Volta record or a solo record or a soundtrack of something. Right. So, and yes, then we did something years back, which then become part of Amputecture, I guess. Right. How how is it working with him, for example? Because I, I mean, obviously I know his music and you know the various bands he's been in, but sometimes it gets very complex. Like there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, do, do, do uh, you feel ever lost working on his projects? Like, oh, what the hell is going on? Or he's very methodical? Or how does he like to work with you? Oh, I I have no idea what he likes about me. To be honest, I, I just. He's just, he, it's so hard to describe because the second we get together, it just clicks and we both do our thing and that's fun. I can't even tell if it's good or not because, because that's not what it is about. It's never about the result. It's, it's always just about doing what we want to do. And, um, same same with the box set we did with our label, you know, the Morris Volta, La Realidad de los Sueños box set. It's just something Omar and I wanted to do, and that was the result. Right. It's it's always about the process. It's always about the, about the process. And of course, but, I mean, yeah. he's, a, he's a fucking musical genius, I guess, and he wouldn't call himself that. I mean, nobody would, but he, he doesn't even really call him as, himself a musician. Right. Or a guitarist. He hates that. Right. He started referring to himself as a multi multimedia artist, which I found weird because I, <laughs> I, I can tell you why. Because we did a couple of records just analog with no computers switched on. And multi multimedia artist always has this kind of screen feel to me. I don't know why. Right. right, right. I always I imagine, I mean. yeah. I always imagine multimedia artists sitting in front of a screen, and I know for a fact that Omar hates that. And yeah, yeah. So, but but uh, but 
but I think the definition, like, because he's, he's so, um, he does so many things, you know, he's a filmmaker, he's a writer, he's an arranger, producer, whatsoever. Um, yeah. It reminds me of Frank Zappa a bit, you know, he can just spit out records, complex records, films. Yeah, uh, yeah it's very similar in, in that That's right. aspect, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, true. And I, I read this, uh, I think it was the interview you guys posted on your Facebook page, the Cloud Hills Facebook page. Uh, an interview with Omar and Cedric, and uh, I might be wrong here, but he says something along the lines of you, you, you were pointing out out some workflow stuff, and that led to the box that eventually. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but do you remember what that sort of workflow thing was that you helped him improve on? Um, I I don't think he meant that like in in a very particular way. I think right. he. I think what he meant was um, I think it goes back to the to the little story I told you about dude less chill and me understanding that chill is <laughs> yeah. is potentially endless and it ha needs to be potentially endless to be productive um, but also I think for him it's good to have someone someone in in the background with a certain kind of structure and i think we just hugely benefit from each other i i i, I extremely benefit from his his way of working like i described it and i think it's also the other way around i don't constantly want to refer to me as a german because that's that that sucks <laughs> But, but you know what I mean when I say yeah, German, yeah, yeah. right? Like that yeah, German yeah, yeah. accuracy and Rigid. being on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, so maybe it's maybe it's that it's just two extremes. Right, right. But but we 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 have a common ground, and that's here in the studio, and and way beyond because we made films together, uh, and 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 many other things. Ah, he's just a he's just a very inspiring person, and yeah. I hope he can say the same about me. So maybe probably it's just that. But how did you guys initially meet? I mean, was that back when he was in de facto? What was that? No, 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 not that long ago. No, no, it was. Right. Um, that was in two thousand five, I think, or two thousand six. We met through a mutual friend. Um, like a person from Hamburg, and and I th I think that person introduced us, but only virtually. Was like, hey, that's my friend Johan. He's got a cool studio. Blah blah blah. And I was working on a, I was working on a fun studio project, and at that time in two thousand five or two thousand six. And I know that he was promoting, I guess it was Francis the Mute over here in Europe. And then he gave me a call <laughs> and said a thing only Americans can say. Uh, and I mean, continental America. Um, he said, hey, I'm in Europe. I can be at your place in seven hours <laughs> so so he is actually in he was actually in paris i guess right. but it felt really close to hamburg for him so he just took the train from paris to to hamburg came here played a solo on my fun project and we talked all night and then he left and i think the next next thing i remember was a similar story when he was in Berlin and gave me a call and said, like, hey, I'm in Berlin. What are you up to? And I'm like, hey, I'm in Hamburg. Um, I'm working on this project. You want to join? And he said, yeah, sure. I just jump on the train. I just have to be back tomorrow morning for the interview. Like, no problem. And then there was a strike going on. And the... Um, 
the train, no, no train was between Berlin and Hamburg. So I thought, ah, shit, I really want to have him on this project. What are I going to do? Uh, I just called him a cab. And that's, um, and that's almost 300 kilometers from Berlin wow. to Hamburg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, shit. And I think, I don't know, I think I paid, I don't know what it was, like 500 euros for the cab one way. And then he's like, oh, can you call me a cab? I need to go back to Berlin in the night. <laughs> and then you have to find that cab driver who does that kind of drive for another 500 bucks. Wow. So, but that's, this, that investment of a thousand euros, you know, I think we both knew that obviously for that project I was working on, that, that was madness, but we kind of were already in love and we thought, hey, it's a long-term investment. And it was because he knew, okay, it might sound weird, but if you look at it on the long run, it's totally reasonable. Hmm. That's awesome, man. Love that story. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's um, a lot of a lot of cab money to pay. But yeah, I mean, definitely. That's something that probably is like, damn. But in the end, it's like, you know, fuck it. Dude, uh, just look where we are now. Just look at that. Yeah, yeah. Look at that box set. Look at what we did with, I don't know, at the drive-in with Bosnian Rainbows, with the Cloud Silt Tapes, part one, two, three. We did so many records together. Mm -hmm. And then just look at that small investment of getting friends of 1,000 euros, of getting a cap from Berlin and back. I know it sounds weird. And when you tell that to a German, that German might be, oh, well, but you made a huge uh, <laughs> minus on that day. And, and you're like, dude, just, just zoom back and get the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys connected and... Oh, me too. Uh, I mean, because <laughs> it sounds to me also that your relationship, which I have a similar relationship, not to compare myself to you guys, but I, there's a producer friend, a, a musician I, I, I used to work with a lot, where it sounds to me I felt the same way or feel the same way working with him as you do, do with Omar, where you as a producer, engineer, you, you have the freedom to express yourself and they just let you do it and obviously you let Omar do his thing and those yeah. those those working relationships are really awesome you know it feels really I know I'm happy for you that you have that it's a rare thing and mm. it's the most important thing um it's the most important thing in the studio it is exactly exactly I yeah. just read this interview with Arnold Schwarzenegger mm. um the other day which I don't know it's it's not about him, but he was. Someone asked him a funny question. He asked him, "What's what's your I don't know training secret? What's the most important aspect of training, like bodybuilding? That's what he did, right?" And he said, um, "The right training partner." Right. And ah, that was right. Of course, you always see those sporty guys hanging around there's always two guys right when you train alone it's when you see a guy train alone it's always weird you need that counterpart you need someone to i don't know to motivate you or to to force you to eat when you need to eat or force you to take a break when you have to take a break and mm -hmm. it's a very very important thing to have definitely yeah it's it's, it's so true very true <clears throat> and working on this this new box set, um, I don't really know how, if I can pronounce it correctly in Spanish, but let's say in English, the reality of dreams, I guess it is, right? Um, what was the process of putting that, that together? Because that's just such a huge <laughs> undertaking. But and obviously it's sold out, so no one can get it anymore. Uh, I tell you, there's some more of it. Is, is, can you yes. say that? Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not a thousand right. ones, but we we held back a couple of. A couple right. of box sets. A couple of thousands. So, no, 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 just a couple <laughs> of thousands. Right, right, right. <laughs> just a couple. Of, you know, there were some, there were some cancellations, some order cancellations because what? people saw it like for twenty bucks, bucks cheaper on Amazon, so they canceled their order and bought it on Amazon. Most ah, of okay. the people who did that, then Amazon canceled their pre-order, so they ended up having none. Wow. Stupid. Yeah, it's not about getting the cheapest option, but. Anyways, we collected those canceled orders and it's, I don't know, 50 or 
a hundred, I don't know, something in that range. And we're going to release that on release day and obviously uh, tell people that like, I don't know, 48 hours in advance on social media, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, well, the process of it all, it's actually, um, 24 months. Wow. Yeah. So I think more or less on this day, two years ago, I had a phone call with Omar and he talked about another project. I can't talk about at this point, but that project lead led us through to to the vinyls and him being in possession of the vinyl rights mm. and so he wanted cloud till to take care of that so we did and then it was just a really long process a very complicated contract situation a very because we're friends you know and when you're friends you have to have a very very watertight contract right it has to be more precise more precise um than than a contract between just some random right. person people Makes sense. yeah so because because it needs to be able to really protect your friendship right so and um so we did that that took a while then then we got all the mixes then we got all the, then then we remastered it. Then we got all the artwork. Not all the artwork was available, so we had to actually buy some of the originals. I spent like two thousand bucks. Another investment that doesn't really make sense at the time, because you know I had the rights, I purchased the rights, and then mm. I had to buy those 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 horrendously expensive <laughs> records on Discogs, and I, yeah. I literally spent like two or three grand just just to buy those fucking vinyls I already owned the rights of. So that was funny, actually. I, I hated it, but when I look back at it, it was funny. So, mm. and then we had to scan the artwork and then obviously do modifications because we had to add our logo, Omar's logo, correct some credits, do the add the new mastering guys and new management, all that kind of credits. Correct some mistakes. You know that on the, that d in the Comatorium, the original vinyl has the wrong cover. Mm -hmm, so yeah, the golden, yeah. the egghead guy it was supposed to be the back cover and the jellyfish man who on that universal pressing was the back cover is the original. So we had to change that. And a couple of other things. And well, Omar is just in love with details. And that was a very, very long process. I don't know, maybe six months or so. Right. Because he's busy, I'm busy. There's the time difference. We cut, what, we weren't always able to get on the phone. So mm. it's just a very, very long process. And then we had to de design that thing, had to come up with the artwork. And ah. Uh. Did you have to send, or did he come to the studio to like listen to the test pressings and the masters? Was that just sending back and forth? Or um, I did that. I, Omar. Obviously, was on copy, was co like CC'd in every email. But um, I spent the first COVID lockdown in May last year listening to every single Mars Volta record out there. <laughs> just on my record player at home, my family just went crazy. And I'm like, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, yeah, no, I did that and he approved it. It's just doing stuff like that, like an, a, a retrospective thing. It's just a lot of work because it involves so many people and so many feelings. You know, there's this whole story about landscape tantrums, the original unreleased, unfinished recordings of Delaus and the Comatorium. So we had like 10 pages. Stevie Chick, a Guardian journalist, write 10 pages of liner notes about that process, about at the drive-in falling apart, about Omar founding the Mars Volta, about landscape tantrums being recorded and then being re-recorded or reproduced by Rick Rubin. So that whole process is in that box set. It's described very well, so I, I won't go into details. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah, sure. Because I can, and and mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah, 
I was just thinking about what you just said about the story, but yeah, obviously let, let's leave that for the people who buy the box set and hopefully I can get my hands on one of them too <laughs> when they become available. Sure. Um, but yeah, is it, how many records is there again? Is it five, six, maybe seven? Yeah, it's six. Well, in the box set, it's it's the six main records plus the unreleased record plus two unreleased B-sides. Right. So in total, it's it's 18 12 inches in the box set right and he looks awesome so man. That, i mean well done that on, makes on, a, on, yeah, yeah so yeah. it makes a total of it makes a total of ninety thousand records that we had to press right and um maybe that sets the the retail price in perspective because we're not getting rich with that project it's 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 very expensive to manufacture ninety thousand records and five thousand box sets I can imagine. I can imagine. But yeah, I mean, still well done putting all together because people are going crazy for it. I mean, I see on, 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 yeah, like Reddit all the time, like people posting their, their box set, you know, it's cool. I mean, it's a nice I know. We should have done, we should have done 10,000. We should have done 10,000, but we yeah, did. It'll be all right, man. People survive. Um, but something, sure. some, something they I need like to, to chill. <laughs> <laughs> do you see it too or what do you, do you see a lot of people asking you for for more records too or do you get a lot of emails about it every day like 20 wow it's a passionate fan base which is great obviously i love it you know i love it i'm active in all those not every day but i'm active in all those fan groups i just think it's 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 a responsibility i have i think those fans are just absolutely amazing and it's the obviously it's the foundation of of any band out there and it's just so shitty how fans get treated from labels just as customers and they they don't care about all the passion and and i know that i know that many people who run record companies i know they have like lots on their plates and stuff and nobody has time for anything but well i have lots on my plate too and i still can answer to email sometimes it takes a day sometimes two but i think almost anyone can do it mm. and so so when people write to our usual email address most of the time it's just me responding because right. why not why shouldn't i yeah yeah i mean i guess that goes back to what you said about doing uh good work <clears throat> yeah. excuse me you know where it's you know like you mentioned Sometimes you have to make coffee and stuff, but it's still all those small details, you know, creates a bigger picture. Yeah. And I mean, communication, that's it. That, it's what I said in the very beginning of this, of this chat, you know, you have to listen, you have to listen. And, and that's, that can be fun. You know, that can be fun and, and conversations can be fun. Obviously I get weird emails too. Um, and, and I get, what, what are some get of the emails you've got that are weird and weird emails like, um, uh, just recently, what was that? Like, uh, because like some, some, some people who ordered their box sets at Bandcamp in the U S right. we sent them out like two weeks ago because we experienced that with the cloud silk tapes during COVID. It sometimes took like three months for wow for the regular mail to, from, from Hamburg to the U S and we wanted to have the people, one of the people to have the box sets on time. So we sent them out four weeks earlier and apparently some of them just got them after a week. So w which was wow. three weeks in advance of the actual release date. And people saw that online and got mad about it and like, dude, why Bandcam? Why not me? Why that fucking guy? And I'm like, <laughs> chill, do chill. It's it's not in our hands. It's like, it, it's mm. COVID and we can't control it. And he's like, refund. Really? I have two words. I have Shit. two words for you. Refund. I'm like, no problem. You get a <laughs> refund. You get a refund. No problem. And then he was like, oh, no, okay, no, I'm good, I'm good, sorry. So okay. what I experience is that the minute you take, you start to take people seriously, because you should, um, uh, uh, um, it, it'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's so funny people going mad about the vinyl because it's not like it can be shared on social, like uh, shared online because you cannot really pirate the vinyl. So, you know, the experience will still be there for him when he gets it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need, that guy needs to chill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, the people w- would also, I mean, I, I don't want to make you say stuff you don't want, you can't say. Uh, but I, I think a lot of the, these Mars Volta fans would, would be very happy with the new Mars Volta record. And I don't want to, I don't know if that's what's going on, but hopefully that's what's going on. Um, but I guess you cannot, you cannot say if that's what's happening. No. No, I'm not in the, I'm not in the position to. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Let's not uh, break any uh, unnecessary NDAs or something like that. <laughs> Oh, I haven't um, signed any NDA. Okay. That's not that's not poss- That's not necessary. But um, right, right. you know, it, it doesn't matter what I say now. People will just twist. Yeah, my yeah, way. take it and spin it. <laughs> but let's leave um, the Morse Volta for a second, because um, I love to ask you. <clears throat> and this actually reminds me of an interview I did uh, with the producer Michael Beinhorn. Uh, mm-hmm. I guess you're familiar with him too, uh, and because I heard you you speak about how bands are trying to sound like bands from 15 years ago, etc., and not creating anything new. And um, Michael was saying, Beinhorn, he was saying, "Oh, people should stop idolizing Beatles, Led Zeppelin, etc., because you know we had them. We should move on to something new." And I thought I would, you know, that resembled what you were trying to say as well in in that quote um do, do, how, how do you how do you try to take bands to that next level being a producer so you don't sound like a band from 15 years ago well first of all it's a songwriting first yeah. of all it's a songwriting if you write a song that sounds like it was, it's 15 years old old either you d- did something very wrong or very right, <laughs> right. you can't tell you know, sometimes a great song is a great song and, and sometimes it needs to be recorded like it was recorded 15 years ago. That's just a decision you can make. And it's totally up to the artist or to to the conglomerate of, of producer and, and, and artist. Um, it's just, it's different all the time. It's different all the time. You know, I'm, 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 I'm just starting to work with an, a new artist from from the Netherlands and he sent me he sent me um rough mixes he recorded it at home and he sent me rough mixes of 20 songs and like 19 great ones and i think the only thing i really think he should change is, is he needs to get in a proper studio with a proper engineer with a proper producer and re-record the songs with a band play it live that's everything that's all it needs hmm. and no not almost no changes in the arrangement or anything it just needs this live approach that's one thing and sometimes it just needs more than that and 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 there are various reasons for that some of them being just one of them being just because people don't want to make a live record because they hate it or because 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 you're aiming for a sound aesthetic that is not live and not artificial just special and you can't create that with three people in a room or something mm. you know i i'm afraid of I, I think it's boring to to say stuff like um i don't want bands to sound like bands or i only record live or uh, uh, I only record like piece by piece, drums, bass, guitars, keys, blah, blah, blah. It just depends on the project and you have to be flexible. And as a mm-hmm. producer, you just have to know that sometimes the most important thing you as the producer are able to add is to do nothing. And that and that nothing then becomes actually a huge thing because it gives confidence to the band. And when you're able to do that, to just give confidence to the band, that can be a huge thing. And normally that's a matter of experience, obviously, but 
when you're like starting and it's your first production or your second production, then you think you have to do something. And that's just not always the case. Sometimes you just have to let go of things. Did I answer your question? I think so. Uh, I, was, I was just internalizing what you said a bit. <laughs> um, but so but how do you try to then, I mean, I don't know how to, to make me phrase it properly, but to push the, the sound further, so to speak, or the artist further. So, but again, it all depends also, like you said, what the project is, I guess. So there's no like... It's preparation. Answer, I think mm. it's two things. I think to first... It go, it, it, I always come back to communication. Mm. First, you have to talk to the band and ask and listen, what do you want to do? What are you able to do? And what are you afraid to do? And what is the thing you can't do? What can I bring to the table? What do I want to do? Where do I see them? Um, and then just talk about some terms i mean uh, at some words actually when we when, when you say you want it fat what does that mean are you talking about frequency range or are you talking about loudness or are you talking about speed tempo are you talking about rhythm is is, is fatness a rhythm thing or is it is it a frequency thing simple things like that because that can re like those those misunderstandings can really mess up the entire conversation and their entire plan. Hmm. Um, th that's one thing, and that leads to preparing a session. So, as a producer, you just have you have to know the songs, you have to know the songs, and and you have to come being able you have to be able to communicate what you like about them and what you think can be improved, hmm. and. And then just start, just get in a room, get an instrument and play and discuss that. Hmm. Makes sense. I mean, so when you talk about the communication and the questions, are there any other specific questions you always ask? I mean, there were some good examples right there, but are there any other questions? What do you want the listener to see when he or she listens to the record for the first time. Mm, that's cool. I always, I always think in, when I make records, I always see them in colors or in moods. And, and I think that's very important. Um, and do you want to make your next record or do you want to make that record and that's not a matter of quality it's a matter of attitude mm. um what else like i said it's it's so it's so different um you know i i just started to work with a band who started as a four piece and then become became a three piece mm. and they're instinct was oh shit now we have to find a fourth person really quickly before we enter the studio and i said i don't know if that's the best thing to do right now i think you can be a really great three piece and let's just discuss the advantages of being a three piece mm. and maybe that changed the entire record and maybe it doesn't let's find out mm. i think it's just about that you have to you have to face what's there you have to accept what's there and everything. It's just, it's so simple and so difficult because yeah, yeah. especially when you're not talking in the same language, for example, mm -hmm. um, communication is everything. Hmm. Has there been any time when you didn't, you didn't have a good communication and it, the whole thing just went to shit? Yes, <laughs> not very often. Right. Um, I think I. Oh, let me think. Um, maybe three times in the last sixteen years. Right. One of them was I wanted to make a record, but my schedule was too full, and I thought I could squeeze it in, and then I canceled, and then the band broke up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's always a, also a matter of communication because. 
because if I would have known that that would that could happen, I would have have treated it differently. Hmm. But no one told me that the band was about to fall apart, or maybe someone told me and I didn't listen. I don't know. Right, right. It, it's 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 a long time ago. The other thing was, I I worked with a pop artist and I had this, I had this I don't want to make pop music approach, and I thought, ah oh, shit, that kid could really be an interesting avant-garde artist with his kind of songwriting. Let's just. Let's just ruin everything and make a weird record. <laughs> and that didn't work. What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that didn't work. And then the third time I was working with a young woman from, I can't know where it is because it's a very small island and everyone will know who it is. So from Scandinavia. Right, right, right. Right. And she, ah, I told her, I think she just wanted to be an electronic artist and that, but she agreed to do a test session with me and, and then I did this thing with musicians and, and presented a rough mix after one day and she was just like, or after two days maybe. And then she was just like, ah, but it sounds so, it sounds like, I don't know. It sounds so, so like a band. I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's musicians. Well, we, we, we're in this room for, I don't know, two days now with musicians and I'm recording on tape. And so right. I can make an electronic album. I, I, I did make an electronic album or maybe two or three couple of years ago. Hmm. But even, even those electronic records sound like people being in a room. You know, I recorded the fingers on, on the, on the keyboard with an extra mic, like stuff, stuff many people did before, but but stuff I do will always sound like people in a room. Right. And that's what I told her. And she was like, okay, but I hate that. I'm like, ah, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. you should have told me. Or maybe I should have told her matter of communication. So yeah, I, yeah. I remember those three, three times when things just didn't happen because of lack of preparation or so. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's good, good examples of always having clear communication, know what the project is, I guess was expected all that yeah because you know because sorry to interrupt you but but no, but good. after that after that you know when you have when you have a mutual goal or or something um just a project that feels like fun for everyone that everything else is just it's just fun and and of course it's it's extremely important which bass drum mic you choose and it's tr mm. extremely important if you compress the vocals right and it's extremely important if you choose that delay or that delay and the timing of the delay <laughs> obviously all that is like life changing but it's a totally different level than communication yeah yeah like exactly. like it shouldn't be even it shouldn't even be in the same interview <laughs> cuz cuz it's such a different thing even though it's not it's it's equally important but it's it's a different mm. story yeah i mean all all the stuff you said about compression that all that doesn't matter if you get the initial communication wrong anyway you know and all that stuff doesn't matter if you don't have a good song i mean yeah, you need yeah, a great, yeah, 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 yeah. you need a great song that's that's <laughs> the most important thing you need a great song that's it mm -hmm. so that's what, because always when i start to work with people i always tell them i don't want rough mixes i don't want pre-production i just want you to sit down at, in your bedroom take your take your phone put it in front of you and play your songs with your instrument and it can sound like shit. And if it doesn't translate like that, the song doesn't work. Mm. Uh, and then second step is obviously the performance. Mm -hmm. Like how you perform that song. And then it's it's the process of recording and all, all the electricity involved. And obviously that's huge fun, but it's it's step three. Exactly, man. Well said. Uh, but you and it's been, I don't want to take much more of your time, um, but it's been a real, real pleasure, man. And uh, yeah, yeah I have to come by, come by Hamburg at some point. I mean, it's closed. So, uh, yeah. Fuck it. 
we're here, we're here, and and I would be happy to show you around. Maybe you make it to the next Cloud Hill Festival. Who knows? Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. we can actually have a host a festival this November or December. Who knows? That would be cool, man. I'll definitely be there. Nice. Awesome. Well, cool. yeah, I mean, also maybe before we wrap up, maybe you can uh, let the listeners know where they can find more info about your studio, like hire you and all sure. that good stuff. Yeah. Okay. In the last minute of the interview, shouldn't we have done it in the first minute? <laughs> <laughs> um, like, okay, okay. 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 Everyone. I'll leave um, links below too. Okay. Okay. Can I make this? Yeah. 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 Okay. You'll you'll find the the address of the studio www.cloudcellrecordings.com here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe if you use it in Insta, just swipe the, out. I don't know if I'm that good at making videos, but I'll leave, definitely leave a link in the description. Or leave it here. Leave it here. Yeah, yeah, the, exactly, exactly. Okay, wherever it's gonna be, and then I have this website called uh, under my name, johanschera.com or .de, and there is a contact form mm -hmm. you just type your thing in your request yeah, that you want to book the studio or whatever or want me to produce your record or make your coffee mm -hmm. and that will land directly here perfect i don't have a secretary i, I do everything myself yeah. so um and that's fun that's awesome. it well I, I, no other links a uh, link to the cloud cell label cloudsill.com you can't miss it yeah exactly any social media i should link to instagram facebook yeah please right uh, uh cloudsill music <laughs> uh, uh johan Shera. uh what else instagram? Cloud yeah at cloudsill music here oh, yeah 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 perfect <laughs> i'll leave all that for people to, to click and i'll introduce it in the beginning anyway so uh don't worry about that uh, but Johan, it was... reconnect with reconnect with Marie. She does our social media and stuff, and she's an expert. She knows how to implement all those links here and there and there. Perfect, will do. But Johan, it was a real pleasure, man, and I look forward to Thank hearing more music coming out of, of from Clouds Hill and all that good stuff. Yay! Awesome. Thank you very much. Pleasure Thank talking you, to you, and, and hope to see you in person soon. Likewise. Thank you, Johan, for coming on. Real pleasure having you here and I hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Again, check out Clouds Hill, check out all the links to Yuan, check out his, his work, it's pretty badass. Uh, and again, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel, to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, uh, wherever you're listening and watching um, this interview. We're growing slowly but steadily and that's all thanks to you. So really appreciate your support. Um, and again, check out the Audio Tribe email list. Just click the link in the description below. Enter your name and email address and you have joined. Uh, and if you join, you get exclusive access to interviews before the public. Um, and much more stuff like to do in the future as we grow. Maybe some exclusive uh, streams like Ask Me Anything sort of uh, Reddit style vibe on YouTube or Zoom. I don't know. We'll see what we can do that works best. Um, but yeah, just hit the link below. And join and I'll let you know all those details as we as we grow uh, but thank you for coming on this week thank you for watching thank you for listening and thank you you for coming on real pleasure and I'll see you guys next week so take care